Welcome ladies and gentlemen, this is Griever back here, bringing you guys the latest Behind the Bar reviews for Seven Deadly Sins, the second to last chapter. As far as I'm aware, uh, this and one more chapter. One more chapter, I believe next week, and that's it. That is it ladies and gentlemen. And I've been reviewing this series for a very long time, so I believe what I'm going to end up doing is I will end up doing a live stream for the final chapter. I won't read the Raws, just for anybody who is in my Discord and always links me to the Raws and stuff. Thank you very much. You guys always link me to Raws for latest chapters, summaries. When the links come out for the English translation, you guys are great. Thank you very much for that, but I'm going to avoid all that. I will live react to the very last chapter of Taizai. I think we should set up a live stream next week, and we'll do that. But we're not here to talk about that, and we're not here to talk about the emotions, about what this means for me. It's a very strange feeling, honestly, because this actually my very first video on YouTube on camera was a Seven Deadly Sins chapter review. I thought I could be the what Tekken 101 was to Bleach. I thought I could do the same thing with Taizai because I didn't see a whole lot of people talking about this. This was back in, I think it was chapter 167 was my first one. Chapter 167 stands out in my mind. It might have been 168, but that that is when I, I first started doing behind the bar reviews. I had already had a YouTube channel that is no longer here. It got um, ousted by Shueisha and such for One Piece reviews and panel usage, but that ended up starting my journey into becoming a manga reviewer on YouTube. So I eventually expanded and stuff, and you guys know I make a bunch of content, but it's a very strange feeling, I gotta say, to know that this is the second to last chapter, you know? And the chapter itself, I don't have many problems with. There's actually some really good points about this chapter. Let's let's start off with some just some very small things. Number one Dreyfus has his badass look back. He's got his long hair back. He looks like a badass. I couldn't take him seriously with the Friar Tuck look. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it with the monk, the cut bangs. Once again, cut bangs are bad on females. I've always said that. You guys know this by now. They're just as bad on males. It, it, it does not discriminate by gender. Cut bangs look bad. They always have, always will. Okay. The other thing. Anybody who knows anything about Arthurian legend would know the answers to these questions before we even got an English translation. Before we even knew, Bon and Elaine are going to have a kid. Meliodas and uh, Elizabeth are going to have a kid. It was pretty. It it was pretty set up. We knew this for a long time. It was discussed on the Boar's Hat podcast. I believe Grim Reaper is possibly going to be doing one. And I, I might be invited. I, I imagine I would be. Uh, but there likely will be one last Force Hat podcast. So make sure to, you know, keep your eyes peeled for that. But I believe it was discussed. We all know what the kids' names would be. I was really hoping, though. I was really hoping it would be something different. But I suppose we can just go through the chapter and then we'll come to that reveal and what I thought. But the, honestly, this chapter had some good points. Like, the beginning opens up with, uh, all right, it's been several months later. I think it was like 18 months or something like that. And we see, okay, there's Slater and stuff with the last member of his, the Dawn's Roar. Or whatever. It was the Dawn's Roar, right? Uh, another poor usage of human characters. I know Zarsal from the Boar's Head podcast hated the misuse of human characters, similar to what how Dragon Ball Z ended up focusing basically Sans or Get, get Out of Here. You know, if you're not a sand, you're not worth my time. You're not going to have significance. You're not going to have a good, great battle. That kind of stuff. So, in the same sense, that's what happened to the humans of Taizai here. So, we had the Dawn's Roar. I like Slater and that samurai dude. I forget his name. Um, the uh, Knights of Azura Sky, Denzel's, uh, you know, brother to Bartra. You know, Prince uh, Denzel's own, you know, fighting force personal elite guard. What you know, like they were, they were significant. Dreyfus and Hendrickson, though you could argue that they had a little more play to do with the more further on in, than any of the other human characters. Gil Thunder, Hauser, Grimoire, like there was a lot of characters that were misused. But it's nice to see them here because um, they're basically referring to the fact that 
we have a new king and queen and such, and Slater, of course, was always duty-bound wholeheartedly to the throne, but more so to Bartra. So this line didn't seem... It goes on with what Death Pierce says later, that potentially there's a, a number of people... I don't believe this is what Slater intended, but you could surmise this as Slater basically saying that he does not approve of a demon on the throne. Simple as that. I mean, they fought the demons. They slaughtered demons. Demons are evil as far as most of the humans and citizens of the Onus are concerned. They're, they're not to be trusted. They're the evil ones. They're the ones we just fought a war with. Why is one of them the king? I don't believe that was what Slater was intending. I believe Slater simply uh, always had it for Bartra. Bartra was the one that he... It wasn't the the idea of the throne, sort of like Biakia from Bleach holding up the law sort of idea. It wasn't some concept of what the throne represents and what being a king represents. It was a personal uh, af affinity with Bartra. He believed that his royal highness Bartra was the one worth following and protecting, not necessarily the throne of the Onus. So that's fair. That's the way I took it, uh, but there it's basically saying that everything is kind of meh now and kind of boring and wish we had something more to do, and they banter back and forth. After this, we I, I believe this is where we jump over to uh, Death Pierce, uh, or is, is it after that? Uh, we jump around quite a bit in this chapter. We jump to Hauser, uh, Jericho, and Gila. Hauser sporting a beard that looks kind of stupid without a mustache. He's got that whole giant chin strap, bushy chin strap going on, and uh, kind of looks out of place, honestly. And he's fighting against Jericho and Gila, you know, training them up as still the leader of the Holy Knights and such. Uh, a fairy comes to get Jericho, saying it's time, and they rush off. During this, after this point, we jump over to the Knights of Azure Sky. We see the two little ones, once again, forget their names, uh, all grown up, it seems, you know, a little bit more muscle-bound, taller, more like teenagers. It's been 18 months, so, you know, it's kind of funny, though. Last time I checked, they were small kids. It's only been, like, less than two years, and all of a sudden, they've sprouted up to look like, you know, 19, 20-year-olds. Like, imagine if, if, so, honestly, that's a bit of a, wait, what? Like, do you remember the little boy? Am I missing something? Am I forgetting whether it was, like, some magic spell that boosted him into an adult form or something? But the little... You know, the little boy and, and, and the girl, the girl who was all about love and, and, and the guy and the little boy who was all about archery and they were like 12 years old and 13 years old, all of a sudden they sprout up to look like they're goddamn the size of Gil Thunder. You know, it's like, wait a minute, what? So I, I found that a little weird. What did you guys think? Am I just reading too much into that? But this is actually the key point that I really want to take away from this chapter. Probably some of the best storytelling we've gotten in a long time from Nakaba in Seven Deadly Sins. Death Pierce, all right, you know what? Kudos to Death Pierce. Kudos to Death Pierce. Let's have a drink for him. Ah, that's refreshing. That has nothing to do with the fact that, you know, I did not toast him just because I really looked, took a look at that beer and thought, damn, I need a drink of that beer. No, no, no. We were doing a proper toast. That is completely unrelated to the fact that that tasted delicious. Okay. Death Pierce has been watched his mentor, his master, his the reason that he became a knight in the first place. His, his you know, Denzel gets slaughtered mercilessly by a demon from trusting a goddess. Now, we saw that storyline progress when the archangels first came and form stigma with the humans of Leonis, or reestablish stigma, I should say. And Death Pierce went up on it. No, 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 no. We, we, we can't trust you. And then brainwashing. Breath of bliss. So, apparently they were made aware about the what Breath of Bliss really was after the war. Uh, maybe they find out after it wears off, they realize... It's 
were we brainwashed? Maybe they came to this conclusion on their own. I really doubt Elizabeth came out and said, Hey, I'm your queen now. By the way, sorry for the archangels. I'm a goddess too, but they were evil as shit and they manipulated you all into dying for them. I'm not going to do that though. You can trust me. I really doubt that was the case. And I can't see anybody else who knew the information that would spread it around. So I'm under the conclusion that once Breath of Bliss wore off, potentially after Ludachelle passed on, or it's it's left ambiguous. I, I'm pretty sure it came out to say that those who possess a grace, so potentially Askinor, but those who possess a grace actually, like their when their physical body dies and stuff, their spirit, it eventually will reform, whether that takes decades or centuries, eventually they will come back. But it's not really immortality, and we don't know at what form because we've never seen this happen. So, not really sure. But either way, however you want to look at it, when Ludachelle died in the mortal realm and left, I assume at that point the Breath of Bliss wore off by that point for sure. And if that's the case, once again, they probably, the ones who remained who were fighting the demons, might have figured out what have I been doing this whole time? Where did these thoughts come from? How did this. And then they came to this conclusion on their own. It's possible. I mean, it's the last couple of chapters, so I'm not going to nitpick. It's like, okay, it's a bit of a stretch to get it right on the money. Oh, that breath of bliss, the manipulation, the brainwashing of the goddesses. And that's exactly what happened. Because it's not actually that far of a stretch to reach. You know, imagine if you were brainwashed for weeks and then all of a sudden you were like, wait a minute, where was I when it all of it come, comes away? How did I have these thoughts? What happened? Why did I think that? Why did I do all that? you'd be a little messed up too. You'd probably check yourself into a you know psychiatric ward if that were to happen to you. So I really I think I, I really enjoy this. I think I think we need to talk a little bit more about this. And of course here's my you know obligatory you know cut right down the middle of a review. Fun fact for those of you who aren't aware why I always tend to do that cut during videos during behind the bar reviews but I don't seem to do them very often at least noticeable or, or at all for anything that I record upstairs in the computer room or office, whatever you want to call it, is the simple fact that I'm recording all my behind the bar reviews on a MacBook with the photo booth app and I have to transfer this to my computer using Dropbox. Dropbox also has a limit of about a gig unless you want to pay for it. So any of my high, high def videos that go over around the 14, 15 minute mark tend to go a little close to that and I would hate to have to re-record and I don't know how to cut it up or compress it here uh, at least easily. I'm not very good at using Macs. So there, fun fact, that's the reason you guys usually see a cut in these reviews. Anyways, that being said, Death Pierce still. I fully understand why the end conclusion for him is that he is leaving this country. Apparently he's one of the people of Edinburgh you know, before the vampires took over, I'm assuming, maybe that's why what happened, Denzel, you know, rescued him or something, and then he felt he owed him or something. There's a whole storyline that could be there. But remember, the vampires of Edinburgh, 10 years ago, at that point, Edinburgh was a lost place and all that such. And th there you go, right? So, Death Pierce apparently is one of the sons of Edinburgh, and he's going there to right some wrongs. Uh, okay, like he's going to rebuild it and such, and he says he's going to rebuild a country for humans and humans alone. He has been betrayed by demons and goddesses alike. He has seen the ugliest side of both both of them, and he cannot stay in this country. Why it took him 18 months to do this? I, I mean, I guess it wasn't properly announced for a long time. They do claim that. Uh, as Meliodas tells Bartro, we're going to go on a honeymoon, we're going to do stuff. For all we know, the coronation happened a month ago for Meliodas and Elizabeth, right? It, so it, so it, it's possible anyways, because I, I'm just sitting there thinking, 18 months is a long time to finally make this decision, but it, it could have very easily only been like three months since the general public found out who was going to be king and queen. And though Meliodas might be a hero and such, such the bitterness that... Uh, of course, Death Pierce and the rest of the Knights of Azure Sky should feel, and, and understandably so, about goddesses and demons and their holy war and how it just, it didn't benefit the humans at all. All it did was cause them all to suffer and lose people they cared about and such. Death Pierce is just like, nope, I can't do this. I cannot live in a country that 
is suggesting that we be ruled by a demon and a goddess. He hates them both. He hates them with a passion. So he decides to leave. Now, I don't know. This would be great setup. Nakaba, this would have been good setup for something. But uh, unfortunately, of course, the series is ending at this junction uh, when I feel like there was more stories to tell, no matter how bad the last 40 or 50 chapters were. Uh, yeah, about 40. 40 odd chapters were, were quite, quite bad for the most part. There was still a lot of potential for more stories, a lot more Arthurian legend stuff to draw from that really could have made great arcs. And I feel like this had the buddings of good foreshadowing into another, another story arc later on down the line. And unfortunately, it'll ne we'll, we'll never see that more, more than likely. However, I, I did really like this nonetheless on its own merit. This was a good, for a such a background character, especially like he's not one of the forefront humans like Gil Thunder or Hauser or somebody. He was one of the more background characters that just showed up and was there for a few battles and a few key moments. That was it. And got some good character development. This makes sense that not everyone, and this showcases that not everyone would be happy, especially after they just fought a war that really had nothing to do with them. It was a goddess and demons. And they, the human kingdoms, were the ones that suffered as a result. You could easily see that Death Pierce's feelings, of course, are personal, but also how there are probably many citizens that also feel the same way. Especially after 18 months. After it's like, the war is over, thank God, the seven citizens saved us. Elizabeth Meliodas, oh, thank God they were here. And then it only takes a few months after that, you know, wave of relief washes over for the negative aspects of that to come into place. For people to kind of resent, well, wait a minute, why did we have to fight such a war in the first place? At first, you're just glad that the fighting's over. Then resent, then people start to use the old noggin again and come to some conclusions that might not be accurate, that might be accurate, what have you, but that's when people, the wave of relief has died down and now something else begins to rise, so to speak. Uh, I really like this. It was the best part of the chapter. It really was, because it showcases a very real-world aspect of the transgressions and what would actually happen. It's not all sunshine and rainbows when that were to happen, and people would blame them. After World War II, people who weren't Nazis but were still Germans were persecuted. For a long time, even to this day, that you go talk to a grandfather who, you know, or, or I guess at this point it's getting a little old for that, but I mean, I'm almost 30, so, but you go talk to someone who survived World War II and such, and they don't really have a great opinion of Germany or the Germans for that matter. Uh, and that is perfectly within their right as someone who had to live through that era where, you know, it became one of those things. So you can see that here. And I feel like that is such a realistic perspective given to us through Death Pierce. So I'm, I'm done talking about that. I think I talked about that for 10 minutes now. But I really wanted to hammer home how good that was because there's not a whole lot I've been able to praise the last, you know, well, the 2020 chapters of, of Taizai. There hasn't been a lot to praise outside of Escanor chapters, 317, of course, and the the chapter, but th this was something really worth looking at, talking about, and such, so I just really wanted to praise it for that, because that was very really well done. After this, we jump over to Hendrickson and uh, Dreyfus. They both retired from knighthood, so to speak. Don't really know how that works. Hendrickson is going to open a potion shop, which, or a, sort of a, I guess, a, an apothecary, and uh, Dreyfus is a sword instructor. Okay. So, I mean, that fits them. I, I don't really get the apothecary. I mean, he's a druid just because he can heal. Like, I guess it's just kind of bland. It's kind of one-dimensional character with Hendrickson from here on out for the rest of the series. But that that was, I guess, the thing. It's fine. As I said, Dreyfus's long hair is back. He looks like a badass again. And I'm like, okay, as a sword instructor, that fits Dreyfus well. Hendrickson doing a small time, I, I guess. And they have some banter back and forth, and that's fine. We jump over to the... After that, we see Bartro with... Uh, Margaret, Gil, Thunder, Veronica, you know, uh, Grimoire, the whole nine yards, talking all about grandkids, talking about this, the toys and the presents they bought for the little one and such. 
Uh, they don't know if it's going to be a boy or a girl. Of course, talking about Meliodas and Elizabeth, of course, are pregnant. Well, Elizabeth is pregnant. Not a big fan of that whole, we're pregnant. Last time I checked, I, I might get a beer gut, but I ain't got a little person growing inside me. I'm not pregnant. My wife might be pregnant, but I'm not pregnant, right? So I never really liked that term, but uh, the whole we are pregnant. But the uh, I like that they just jump back to Barcher's ability because it makes so much sense. He's got vision. He knows when the baby's going to show up. He knows whether it's going to be a boy or a girl. I'm like, okay. Barch of Visions are not wrong. So far, from what I understand, I don't. they are left up to interpretation sometimes. So some things, things aren't completely clear. But I don't think a single thing from Barch's Visions have ever actually been proven wrong. So there you go. So he knows exactly what's going to happen. And I, and I like the fact that he's having a lot of fun with that. You know, they're, they're, it's just a nice comedic scene between Bartra, the two daughters, and of course, Gil Thunder and uh, Grimoire. So that's that's pretty nice. We jump over to the Fairy King's Forest. We see that Elaine, I, I, I know she's supposed to be thousands of years. I'm just not into the lolly thing. I, I just can't do it. I, I, I need a drink. No. Now, granted, yes, she is in her adult form, it looks like. It's been 18 months, and everybody seems to have grown somehow. Uh, but it's been 18 months, and yes, she seems to be in her adult form where she's actually not looking looking like a nine-year-old. Okay, fair, but it's still just it's a little creepy for me. It's a little bit... I mean, that's just Japanese culture and stuff. They, they have a more wider, a more... Um, Pro not progressive, that's the wrong word to use. I I, I don't know, a, a looser idea of what's creepy and what's not, I guess. I, I don't know. They they have a broader I say for that stuff. I'm more I'm more like this when it comes to that. It's like, no, no, staying away from that. So for those of you who also agree, yeah, it is kind of creepy. So uh but Bond's happy, everyone's happy, it's the first apparent uh it's gonna be the first human fairy hybrid ever and nobody even knew that was possible and then of course we also have the same thing uh a very nice scene it sucks that our our, our great man Zeldris, and that's of course this is why i'm featuring this cover uh bon and meliotis of course because both of them are fathers to be so it felt like an appropriate volume to showcase for this review uh but Zeldris and gelda apparently they are now on good terms so they didn't just fly off to the demon realm or something. Maybe they did. Maybe they can come and go as they please. It's like gateway. Maybe one of them all of a sudden became Kisuke or Ahara. Like, yeah, I'll open up a gateway to Soul Society. It's fine. Oh, here's Wake Mundo. It's fine. Ah, uh, here's Hell. It's fine. You know, one of them maybe can do that. I don't know. But either way, uh, Zeldris and Meliodas must be on better terms now. They seem to all be getting along. I don't know if they'd like double date or anything, but it seems they showed up and they both were shocked, wide eyes, embarrassed, like, what the hell, that's possible? They're probably thinking, oh shit, maybe we can give this a go. Zelda's just kind of like, yeah, yeah, maybe we can. Now, I mean, that that doesn't happen, but I guess it's never been assumed because have we actually ever seen that in the series? Have we seen like a hybrid between um, giants or humans or... Maybe giants and humans we have, have we? No, I don't think I don't think we ever seen a hybrid. So this is new for everyone: fairies and humans. And then we have, of course, demon and goddess. That seems like opposite ends of the spectrum. But if chaos really did create everything, everything stems from one source. It's not entirely impossible, I guess. But either way, I mean, they're both. Elizabeth also points out that while well, technically I am still, she says something like semi-human or half-human, and I'm kind of like, okay, once again. That leads to the illusion thing being weird, or the the possible future thing where she dies of old age and everybody else is slow has just died. Sort of idea that she would die of old age if she's still half goddess. I would assume it's kind of like, okay, yeah, you're not immortal anymore. You won't live for millennia. But you probably got a couple centuries in you. Sort of idea, like kind of a a mix, kind of like a, a halfway mark. You know, sort of like the Dunedain from Lord of the Rings. You know, there are. They, they can live for a couple hundred years before they die. They, they have long lifespans for humans, but they still die, right? Because they still have that little bit of that blessing, that little bit of that elvish blood going on. So, uh, 
but yeah, this, I, I don't know. I really like the, the fact that we got to see Zelda's and Gelda one more time. I doubt we're going to see anything else. If it was only one panel, it's fine. As I said, I think that maybe they're going, well, vampire, I, I mean, if goddess and demon, and if human and fairy, vampire was a human at one point, and I'm a demon, and we're seeing that that's a thing, so maybe vampire, human, and demon can give it a go. Let's try this, you know? So that's that's what I'm assuming is going on there. Um, as I said, the last part of this chapter here, with, of course, the naming of the kids, and they named them both Bond names, of course, uh, his kid. And we get some Meliodas drama about that, just, hmm, 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 he still can't decide on the name. We finally get the names of both of them, and it's... Tristan and Lancelot. And as I said at the beginning of the video, anybody who knows anything about Arthurian legend could have called that just with a simple Google search. It wasn't hard. I looked that up back when I first got into Ties. I was like, this is based on Arthurian legend. I brushed up on it. I looked up of every type of Bond character, Elaine, uh, Elizabeth known as Isabel uh, back then. Uh, but in, in the actual term, Meliodas, who's Tristan, who's Lancelot, Gawain, all that stuff. You know, you, you look up all the poems and you find all the stuff, right? So it was pretty obvious. And I don't mind it too much, except for the fact that I was really hoping because they decided to do the double pregnancy chapter. They didn't need to do that. We never needed to know that Bond and Elaine had a kid. We never needed to know that. But... I really would have liked one of them, at least, to name the kid Escanor. I really think that would have been a way to really... That would have got to me. Like, let's go against... I mean, for God's sakes, the real Meliodas and Arthurian legend and the real Bond... Bond was never an immortal. Elaine was not a fairy. Isabel was not named Elizabeth and part goddess reincarnation. And Meliodas was certainly no goddamn demon. So... You know, where there's quite a few liberties here outside of just a name. I feel like it would have been really, it would have been much better owed to Escanor that they both, after all this time, 18 months have passed and stuff, but they still miss their friend, their comrade, the one sin that they actually lost in this whole thing that they would name their kid Escanor. And especially here, with uh, once again, I read the Raws for this chapter before it came out. And when I saw that they were going to name the two kids and the last shot is Melio was walking over to the window, the sunshine clear as day beaming into the great, you know, whatever master bedroom they're in and looking on towards to the sky with one word or whatever. And it's a bright sunny day and the sunshine beaming in. I was like, even that shot lends so much. It could have been a simple line of dialogue for Melio. could have just both said, Escanor. And the girls would have been fine. And then that last shot of Meliodas, you know, looking up at the sun, he goes, just something about, we still remember you, you know, big guy, or what, whatever, what have you, something cheesy, something like, you know, uh, your legacy will live on, uh, you're gone but not forgotten, something, anything. Especially, and also the opening panel, I know it's supposed to be just a random hand, but that's not Bond's hand, and that's not Meliodas' hand grabbing the little child's hand sort of idea. That is clearly, who do, whose hand did everyone think that was on the cover page? Whose goddamn hand? All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. I'll save the rest for the review, and I'll, or not the review, the live stream, of course, uh, next week for all my thoughts and theories and the way I think things should have been. This will not be the end of 7 Daily Sins content, but I'll be talking about all that stuff on the live stream next week. I can't promise it'll be the day the chapter comes out, you know, because I believe that live stream is probably going to be a very long one. Probably over the two hour mark. I'll probably try to make up a list. Maybe the weekend after or something like that. And I'll try to hold off. I'll try to get it out during the week. Whenever the chapter does drop. But I can't promise it will be that day like usual. So either way it depends on work and all that stuff. And the stuff that's happening around the globe right now. You never know. I might cut internet next, you know. But either way... uh Hope you guys enjoyed the chapter. I thought it was great. That's a nitpick thing, as I said at the end. I just felt that they could have still made an ode that, you know, when Meliodas was trying to come up with names, he could have said Tristan, Lancelot, Gawain. He could have, you know, uh, uh, Kane. He could have brought up a bunch of different names uh, to make a reference point 
so that those in the know would get it and then settle on Escanor. I feel like that would have been the really nice thing to do. Bon and Lynch still could have named their kid Lancelot, but with Meliodas being the focus, being the main character, it just would have been nice, especially with that final shot, as I said, him sunshine beaming in and all that stuff. It would have been nice, you know. Um, I, I just felt that that would have really gotten into the feels. That's all. But anyways, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the chapter. As I said, that's a nitpick thing. I think the chapter was really good, the Death Pierce thing being the best part about it. The only disappointing thing was that Escanor was not one of the baby's names for me, but that's a personal thing. Uh, still a pretty good chapter. Art was fine and all that. So but what did you guys think? How do you feel that this is the second last chapter of Taizai we're ever going to get? How does that make you feel? Let me know in the comments section down below. Don't let this last arc, this past year of Taizai, tarnish your opinion of the series as a whole. It hit the ground running. It was a fantastic 9 out of 10 easy first season on, you know, dubbed and subbed, manga. It was fantastic. That first arc was on on the ball. Awesome. Easy a 9 out of 10, if not 10 out of 10. Great story. Second, kept going. It was getting good. You know, so the majority of it is still pretty good. There are about... Roughly about 250, arguably 250 to 300 great chapters in this series. Or at least good story. There's about a, a 250 to 300 chapter good story here. It just so happens that the last 50 or so chapters really put a bad taste in a lot of people. You know, a bitter taste in our mouths. That's all. But don't let that affect your opinion of the series as a whole. I still love Ty's Eye. I just did not like this arc. So, anyways, that's it for me. Like, comment, subscribe. Don't forget to join the Discord. Link will be in the box below. If you guys want to know every single time I drop a video, you can do that there. Or, of course, you can always hit the bell notification and you'll be informed every single time a video I post goes to YouTube. That being said, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a crazy ride. I don't know what I'm going to do next. All right, we'll see you back here next time. Responsibly as always, this is Griever signing.